This is our second video from Unit 5 about impulse and bouncing. This video is really going to be an extension of yesterday where we extend our knowledge about what an impulse is. I want you to be very comfortable with using the impulse formula to calculate the change in momentum and we'll talk about actually three formulas that I want you to be comfortable with. I want you to be able to explain how um, changing the time of an impulse can affect the force and that's going to be related to using the formula. And today, something new is going to be how an impulse is different when an object bounces versus when an object kind of sticks during a crash and it comes to a sudden stop. I want to start this video by looking at number four of our bell work, which asked, which has more momentum, a one kilogram ball moving at 1,000 meters per second or a 500 kilogram ball moving at two meters per second? To analyze that question, we need to remember our formula for momentum. So here's the question, and the answer was they have equal momentum. Using our formula P equals MV, the only difference between these two is that this scenario had a ball with a very small mass moving at a very big velocity. The other example had a ball with a very big mass moving at a very small velocity. So, if you change one of those two things, mass or velocity, and make one big and one small, you could end up with the same momentum. The same is true when you're looking at impulse. Remember the formula for impulse. Impulse equals the product of force and time, or force times time. So you could imagine a similar scenario where you could have something with a small force and a large time, and get the same impulse as if you had a large force and a small time. This is going to be a really key point for today. I want to give a couple of examples and then after this video we're going to watch another video about how this very concept works in saving our lives when we drive cars. The first example I want to look at is with boxing and the whole purpose of boxing has to do with physics. What you want to do is maximize the impulses that you have on your opponent and minimize the impulses that you have on yourself. And the strategy to do those things is kind of different but involves this formula with impulses. Let's take a closer look at each. Now remember an impulse is a change in momentum. So you could rewrite this formula to be a change in momentum, mass times velocity. So how do you maximize the impulses on your opponent? Well what you do is you just try to throw punches with a very high velocity. So if you increase velocity then you're gonna have these big impulses. That's how you'd maximize those impulses on your opponent. Now how do you avoid high impulses on yourself? Well, this is a strategy called rolling with the punches. And it's shown in this illustration right over here from your physics book. Now can, you can imagine if you just kept your face uh, right in place, what's going to happen is you're going to feel a very large force on your face. Now what happens is if you move your head with the punch, that's called rolling with the punch, the time that you get hit becomes extended. So you still feel the same impulse, but what's less is this force. Because you roll with the impulse or you roll with the punch, what's going to happen is you increase that time and decrease the force. All right, so an impulse that could have been like this, if you didn't roll with the punch, that's supposed to be a T, now becomes an impulse like this, because you did roll with the punch. I think it's fascinating to look at these pictures of people getting punched in the face. You saw one on the last slide, and now here are a couple. So these are high-speed photographs of people actually getting punched, and you can see the tremendous amount of force on somebody's face. This one's crazy. And you can see this guy, he's got a lot of wiggle room in his face. And this one I just thought was really funny, 
over here, imagining this little baby delivering all these punches to these people. Another example I want to look at is a couple instances of crashes. Here's a crash of a motorbike, of a dirt bike. And I really like this series of photographs where you can see somebody wiping out up here, and then it kind of progresses in this way. So what you can see is the person's momentum stopping all the way to zero, but at the end, what's really, really neat is this person gets up and walks away. So they're going really fast, and their momentum stops all the way down to zero. So what does this have to do with what we've been talking about? Well, by having all of these little small collisions that happen all along the way, what happens is this biker increases the time that they're receiving this change in momentum and that decreases the force. So what happens is that many small collisions are a lot better if you're in this situation of a crash instead of one big collision. I found a really cool example of this that I want to share with you. While reading about this I found several examples online about people that survived jumps from planes without parachutes. And here's a really famous example. So in 1994, there's this British man who was doing a bombing run um, in Berlin, in Germany. So he's flying one of these 300, uh, 300 bombers, and it caught on fire. So there were seven crew members in there, and this guy was 21 years old, and this happened in 1944. And what happened was the plane caught on fire because it was attacked by, um, by a German plane. So, in, in desperation, um, this, this crewman who didn't have a parachute decided that instead of staying on the burning plane, he was going to take his chances and jump without a parachute. Now, what happened is he jumped from the plane without a parachute because he didn't want to burn. Instead, he'd just rather die from splatting on the ground instead of burning to death. And he survived. He fell 18,000 feet and live to tell about it. Now when he tells the story, what he says was that his, um, his fall was broken by a whole bunch of pine trees and by about 18 inches of soft snow that were, that were on the ground of where he landed. His injuries was that he only had a sprained leg. And ironically, the six other people that were on the plane with him, they all died in the plane crash. So how did this happen? Well, the key here is those pine trees and that snow. So what happened is by having all of these little collisions, Nick increased the time of his impulse change and therefore minimized the force and was able to walk away from this alive. The last thing that I want to talk about in this video is bouncing. So in other words, Comparing collisions where something bounces off of another thing versus when something kind of sticks to something else. And what I want to tell you right off is that the impulses are a lot greater when an object bounces versus when an object kind of just sticks. And the reason is there's a much greater change in momentum and it has to do with the change in velocity. Let's explore this a little bit more. So here are the two different scenarios. In this scenario, there's a car that's moving and it hits a wall. And when it hits that wall, it just stops. So its velocity changes from five meters per second to zero meters per second. If you looked at its momentum, its momentum goes to a positive value here and then to a zero value here since the velocity is zero. This is supposed to be an arrow, but it didn't copy over very well. Now what happens in the other case where there's a bounce, the initial velocity of this vehicle, this car, is still five meters per second, but then after it hits this wall, it bounces off. And now its velocity is four meters per second. And remember, velocity is a vector, so now this is going the opposite direction 
And so it's almost like negative 4 meters per second. So in this case, you're not going from positive to zero, you're kind of going from positive to zero, and then from zero to negative. So this change in momentum is like adding these together. And that's why bouncing can cause a greater change in momentum. Let's explore this with numbers a little bit. To explore this with numbers, we kind of have to review all of the different formulas that we've looked at. So remember, the momentum formula is P equals mv, momentum equals mass times velocity, and the impulse formula, we said impulse, is equal to force times time. But the impulse definition, we said the impulse is a change in momentum. So what I want to do now is just smash these three things together. Let's give it a try. It might seem confusing, but just kind of hang in there. So we said that impulse, the formula, is force times time. And we said the word definition for impulse is change in momentum. So, remember our symbol for change? That was delta, or this triangle. So, all I did was I put the formula for impulse over here, and I put change in momentum, kind of the word definition for impulse over here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this. I'm going to swap this out for our formula for momentum. Let's see what this looks like. So now we have force times time, the formula for impulse, equals the change in momentum, mass times velocity. So I've just swapped out momentum for the formula for momentum. So two different ways that you can write this are right here. So in this way, the delta is before the complete definition for momentum. But in the examples that we look at, the mass isn't going to change. What's going to change of an object is going to be its velocity. So, you can put the delta in front of the velocity instead. So this is going to be a really important formula that's just a mashup of everything that we've had before. Let's put this formula to work by looking at our bouncing example with the car. So again, here's the formula where this D is supposed to be a delta. Let's look at case A where there's a bounce and compare it to case B where it's kind of like a stick instead of a bounce, like a sticky collision. So in this case, the impulse over here is the mass times the change in velocity. So let's just for argument's sake, say that this car has a mass of 10 kilograms. And cars are heavier than that, but 10 is an easy number to work with. So in this case, what's the change in velocity? Well, you're going from 5 this way to 4 this way. And to get this change in velocity, since this is like a negative 4, you have to add those together. So the change in velocity is 9. And we're pretending that the mass of this car is 10. So the impulse is going to be... 90. And that would be newtons seconds or kilograms times meters per second. But that's not what I'm going for here. Let's look over here. Now in this case, the change in velocity is from 5 to 0. So that's going to be a 5. If we solve this out, that's going to be 50. So a bounce has a much greater impulse than a collision that's sticky. And it's because not only do you have to stop the momentum and go to zero, but you have to throw something back too. You throw it back, you bounce it back at four meters per second. So that's all for this video, and I hope it helped.